Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Shane, and I'm on the MIT Sloan Research Papers team. And I'm here to welcome you to the afternoon section of the research papers. Um, I'm here to introduce John Salmon and his colleague, Willie Harrison. Um, John will be presenting today. And he'll be talking to us about bullpen strategies for Major League Baseball. We'll have about a 20-minute presentation. And then we'll have about five minutes at the end for any questions that you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, first of all, thank you for attending. I realize I'm competing with food, and of course, data analytics is in common with all of us here, of course, at this conference, but perhaps even more so, it's, it's food. And so uh, thank you for still uh, sacrificing maybe some, some colleague discussion time over your, your lunch to, to come and learn a little bit more about baseball, and in particular, some bullpen strategies that my colleague and I have, have investigated the last uh, year or so, and hopefully, It'll help you out in terms of your fantasy baseball teams. Uh, maybe you're uh, thinking about being a manager someday. Hopefully you all are. And so all these things will eventually pay off, I think, uh, down the road. So this first slide right here is kind of the, the three essential questions that my colleague and I had been asking ourselves for the last little while. And in fact, this last playoff season was kind of a vindication of these questions. And of course they are, well, what if your best pitcher could finish the game? I think everyone would raise their hand if I said, if you were the coach of Michael Jordan or Steph Curry or LeBron James, you'd want to have those players on the court that last minute, last two minutes, last five minutes uh, to, to finish the game. In baseball, it doesn't happen quite so often like that. We all know that a decent amount of the, the salary cap or the, the, the funding goes towards the, the pitcher, which is quite often paid the most, not, not in all cases, but quite often. And it's unfortunate how sometimes that very expensive but very capable and talented asset is, is in the dugout during the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, what have you, inning in those games that are very tight. Ideally, you want to have those, those men on the mound during those innings, the best player at the end of the game. A similar question, what if non-starting pitchers start? Okay, it's slightly different in the sense that is there a way, or is there a rationale, is there a defense for having non-starters actually start the game? If you kind of think about uh, baseball, there's you know, nine sort of independent innings, and you can flip them back and forth in different ways, and, and so there's maybe some potential there to kind of explore starting in different ways. And last one, you know, could pitching reduce the home field advantage? Okay, what can you do to kind of leverage different uh, individuals to actually reduce that home, home field advantage? We'll kind of talk about that first. So first of all, we took a look at 35 years of data from Retro Sheets, and you find this home field advantage, HFA in this presentation, whoops, Let's do that here. Um, of uh, 0 0.1 through 3 runs per game. That's kind of the differential, OK? The home field advantage based on just absolute score data. But there's a problem with that, OK? Because once you plot the differentials across all the different innings and you integrate up those two red and blue lines, you're going to get uh, an erroneous result because of the fact that of all the sports at this, con at this conference, baseball is a little bit different. You don't sometimes play the second half of that last inning. Okay, so as a result, uh, you get some skewed data and skewed results. So we're going to take a look at this data and really talk about what can we do to kind of minimize uh, that the home field advantage and then kind of correct some of those problems that result when you don't take into consideration this correct data. Okay, so of course you can see the anomalous of first and second innings a little bit different in terms of the leadoff batters. Quite often you're going to have your best batters first. And maybe by the second inning you're going to have uh, your, your second half of that lineup start to play, and then of course it starts to, the fluctuations start to even out. But of course you'll notice that that ninth and then that tenth inning is a little bit different. Okay, we'll talk about it here in the next slide. But we can also take the differential between those two red and blue lines, and you can notice that a substantial benefit is in that first inning, okay? And then of course it kind of flattens out between the two, three, eighth innings. And then of course in the ninth, uh, the differential indicates that, well, there's a, a visiting team advantage, which of course is, is not true. It just means that we're not playing the second half of, of the inning. Uh, of the ninth inning. Okay, so uh, as I said, that ninth and tenth inning are kind of interesting, but there's still uh, this home team sort of home field advantage in those, especially like when there's, there's ties at the end of the game. And 52.43% of those games are still won, and so there's still an indication that there's something amiss with this with, with this data. Okay, and as I, as I said before, every home uh, team wins leave unused outs, okay, in, in the bottom of the ninth. And so based upon that last inning, Okay, we're going to have some, some problems with the analysis in terms of calculating HFA, that home field advantage. 
Okay, so how to fix this? Well, we're gonna estimate the scoring data for innings nine and 10. You've already seen it, it's plotted right there um, on the little black uh, square. And then only use innings due to eight since the first and the second innings are irregular, as I said before. Okay, so how do we adjust in this HFA? Well, we kind of take a look at the uh, average differential for innings you know, three through eight, and then we're gonna add on, okay, the probability that we're gonna play these higher order innings and then adjust it uh, accordingly. As a result then, with this adjustment, we find that the first inning accounts for 21% of the total HFA. In other previous papers, it's been a little bit higher than that, but that was because we had this erroneous result where we're taking a look at those extra inning problems that I've just mentioned. So without the adjustment then, the first inning would appear to be 67.5%. And so as a result then, the total HFA is actually on average 0.429 runs per game rather than the, one, the 0 0.133. So all of a sudden now, we need to try to address this. It's a little bit more impactful. Trying to figure out, well, how can we reduce this home field advantage? Is it based on uh, the field or the stadium? Is it umpires? Is it just like the noise? Is it the, famili the familiarity? And we're trying to address, well, what if it's just actually the pitching, okay? And so here's, here's what we have. Um, the recent results indicate that the first innings disproportionate HFA, okay, is, the, is due to the visiting starters, okay, the, the pitcher there that's gonna pitch in the bottom of the first inning, cooling down in the dugout for a long period of time. And, there was, and there's been some data to suggest that for every second that he's sitting in the dugout waiting for his turn to pitch, he throws a little bit worse in the bottom of the first inning. Okay, a huge, a huge problem. Okay, so how can we address this? Well, this is kind of where the, the controversial stuff comes into play, because now we're gonna maybe not ask necessarily your starter to start the game, quote unquote, but have kind of a single batter starter strategy. Okay, so let a pitcher start the game by facing one batter only, okay, that, that first guy, and then replace him with your true starter at that second batter. Okay, so the visiting teams would still suffer from the cool down effect for that opener or that starter, Okay, but it's only gonna affect one person. In the meantime, you have your real starter in the bullpen warming up accordingly, um, pitching, keeping hot, that sort of thing, and then as soon as the top of the first inning is done, well then he steps onto the mound, does a few practice pitches, and he's ready to go. There's no cool down effect in the dugout. So we calculate that this strategy would remove about 8.6% of the overall HFA, um, and that's gonna result to about three runs per year over 81 visiting games. Maybe it's not a lot, Okay, but it can maybe be one or two games, and in fact, we found that 18% of all the games in our database were won or lost by one, by one run. Okay, so you're looking at maybe two games, and the thing is that this is, this is on average. So in fact, you could actually play you know, this cat and mouse sort of game between the batter and the pitcher a little bit more, where if the first leadoff batter is really not so good at hitting against left-handed pitchers, well, you have that opener sort of guy be, uh, be a left-handed pitcher. Okay. In addition, because that pitcher knows, and you're very transparent as a manager, that you're only gonna have him pitch to one batter, you can have him leave nothing on the table. Launch five or six fastballs as fast as he can go, and knowing that, of course, he's gonna be pulled out the, the moment, of course, that, that first batter is, is done with his, with his at-bat. So, in fact, uh, three runs per year might even be increased if you kind of start playing a little bit more to the advantages in the one-on-one -on -one sort of matchups. Okay, and also, since we have the most recent baseball game in our minds, of course, the, the seventh game of the, the World Series, we start asking ourselves, well, let's revisit that problem. And that question as to when we should pull pitchers out, when should we put pitchers in, was uh, uh, Joe Madden's sort of decision to, to put Chapman in, a good one after he'd been played two games in a row, and we're gonna take a look at some data here in the next couple slides to really ask that question again in a new way, when should we pull a pitcher out and revisit it from a new context and some new perspectives. So in terms of the data, we looked at about 700,000 pitches over the 2015 season. Why 2015? Well, because when we were writing this paper and doing the analysis, the 2016 year hadn't been finished yet, and so we're taking a look at the most recent data that we had available um, before the, uh, the playoffs had started. So you look at this graph, and hopefully this sort of stuff really gets you excited. If not, you're probably at the wrong conference. Okay, looking at this data right here, you can see that there's quite a bit of spread in terms of who's pitching what pitches. Okay, so everyone on the blue side okay, are our starters. Okay, they're starting the game on that first inning, and you can notice that over the course of the season, there's upwards of more than 1,000 pitches that they're gonna pitch. And of course, on, on the far left, I think uh, Jake Arrieta, which we're gonna talk about quite extensively today, is I think kind of second to the total far left. And now all the pitchers on the right, generally speaking, that are colored in red are those that are non-starters. 
Okay, and you'll notice then that there's kind of this interesting bend in, in the corner. Okay, and we asked ourselves, well, why is that? Why is there no sort of a three inning pitchers that fills in that gap? Is there some potential or untapped opportunities to use your, your bullpen pitchers in a little bit different way? Okay, and again, as I just mentioned, we saw that in the, in the seventh, maybe the fifth, sixth, and seventh game of the World Series, where people realized, you know what, there's no tomorrow, so I'm gonna really use to the full potential in my, my bullpen, effectively. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So on the left-hand side of this slide now is kind of our paper from last year, where we were trying to capture the instantaneous component ERA to kind of grab when someone is struggling, when someone is doing well, and try to have some sort of, in our minds, some sort of a stock chart, if you will, for price points, as to the trend going up, the trend going down, the five-day moving average, 200-day moving average, all these types of things that hopefully a lot of you uh, financial and business students are interested in, to really say, hey, I don't wanna just know that ERA today, I wanna know what it was a week ago, and is this individual trending up or down? But even the ERA, the component ERA, was based upon uh, the outcomes or the events of different batters. And so you can see on the x-axis right there on the right-hand graph that uh, the, the independent variable, of course, is, is gonna be a number of batters. We wanted to break it down even more this year and try to say, well, what is kind of the, the defining decomposition factor for different pitches? And that's, of course, classifying things in, in, in how the pitch was thrown. Okay, and so we go to the strikes to balls sort of analysis and a ratio to identify, well, where is a pitcher pitching at a given moment in time? And so the right-hand graph right here is what we're gonna try to build up in the next couple slides to say, hey, how is a pitcher doing at any given time? Is he out of the league, so to speak? Is he right on track? Is he trending up? Is he trending down? And we'll talk about that here in the next, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is a video. I'm gonna have our cameraman uh, turn on the video right here. And we're gonna walk through how Jake Arrieta uh, pitches. You can see this little red dot going up and, and to the right. And for every single ball he throws, that little red ball is gonna move to the right and every strike he throws is gonna move up. And so ideally you wanna, in generally speaking, you wanna move up as high as you can to have that slope of that line as, as, as vertical as possible. As soon as he's done this first game in the season now, we're gonna start the second game. And in this particular case, he did a little bit better. He was kind of ahead of the batters a little bit more. Uh, you can see right here, he throws a bunch of strikes here in just a second. Um, and then of course, he throws some balls in a row. Okay, and you can kind of get a feel for how he is performing based upon uh, strikes to ball ratio. Okay, and so this trend line right here, where you can start to make some analyses. Now the third game of the season in 2015 is where he's kind of uh, splitting the difference. Okay, it wasn't quite as good as the second game, it was a little bit better than the first game. And so for each one of these games now, we can start to say, well, how's he doing? Is he behind on the count? Is he throwing more balls and strikes? And slowly but surely, we can build up this profile. Okay, and in fact, this, this fourth game, he was kind of struggling a little bit. You can tell by uh, a low uh, strikes to balls ratio. And now what I'm doing is accelerating the video and we're throwing on all these games really quickly. Okay, so each one of those black lines is what the, the current game is. And then we're building up kind of this region, this profile. In fact, we call it sometimes the, the, the thumbprint, or in this case, the pitch print of an individual, of an individual batter, or sorry, an individual pitcher. And so we can use these regions to identify if he's tired, if he's strong, if he's trending up, if he's trending down. Okay, all these different things can now be analyzed in terms of the context of kind of their, their pitch print or this region of, uh, of pitching that they're gonna take on. Okay, so there's another video right here. You can see that on the left-hand side, we've got the same sort of pitch print, if you will. I've colored now all those games with different colors. And we're gonna just kind of cycle through different pitch prints of other uh, pitchers. We're gonna start with a whole bunch of starters. You can see sometimes that the variance or the range in which they're gonna be covering the, the pitch, or rather the uh, strikes to balls uh, ratio area is gonna be higher or lower. You can sometimes see that uh, managers pull their pitcher if they're uh, pretty low in terms of the strike to balls ratio. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about some non-starters. So right here, you can see that uh, they're only pitching maybe 30 pitches a game. Um, sometimes they're gonna be a little bit higher in terms of the strikes to balls ratio compared to the starter, sometimes a little bit lower. Sometimes they do really well, and so the manager keeps them in, and so you can sometimes see them reach up to 40 or 50 pitches per game, even if they started in the fifth or sixth inning. And so very quickly, you can start to identify where an average pitcher should be, where an average non-starter should be, and where an average starter should be, and make comparisons against those individuals. Okay, so now here, instead of in video form, we've got a four by four chart of, of 
16 different starters, and we collapse or aggregate all this data together to kind of get a trend line of where these starters should be for, for pitching. Okay, and so that chart on the right then, of course, is the aggregate, the composition of all these different starters to say, hey, if you are pitching below that trend line, maybe you need to make a trip out of the mound and talk to him. Okay, if you're above, looks like he's in the zone, he's doing pretty well, things are looking up, and so you should kind of keep him in there. Uh, the strikes to balls ratio now for the non-starters, as expected, they're not pitching as many times. Okay, they're hovering down there in the kind of the, the lower corner. They might be pitching more games. So the density of the strikes to balls ratio sort of uh, uh, com composite sort of pitch uh, print is gonna be a little bit higher, but you can see now how the managers are responding with this particular region. Those uh, profiles above that trend line, okay, are uh, allowed to go a little bit further in terms of more pitches, whereas those pitchers that are kind of strike to balls ratio pitching low Get, tend to get pulled out, and so you can kind of see that there's a skewed factor towards above the trend line based upon the performance. And so now we've got those two together. We link them together, and this then, of course, is gonna be the league composite view. Okay, and so the graph on the right-hand side, of course, is just adding up the non-starters and the starters together, and kind of get a feel for sense of, hey, well, what is kind of the average strike to balls ratio for the entire league? Okay, and I've colored the one on the right-hand side based upon the occurrence or the frequency of these different ratios. Okay, clearly everyone starts at a zero, zero, and then they either go to a one, zero, or a zero, one on the strikes to balls ratio, and that's why you get the, the strong red color at the, the bottom right on, on the right graph. And it's interesting that there's uh, one fellow, um, Tyler Matzik on the, the Colorado Rockies, that's interesting enough, he was able to pitch about, you know, 70 pitches, but his ratio was phenomenally low. And in fact, if you kind of look at that game against uh, Arizona, he pitched uh, eight balls in a row, I think in kind of the, the second inning or the first inning, um, they weren't able to score against him. But then again in the third inning or it was the fourth inning, he pitched nine in a row. Again, you can kind of see that by the horizontal lines right there. Uh, and yet they didn't score any on him. And so I think that's why the manager was allowed to let him sit there. But definitely that, that's one game that's kind of an interesting outlier. Okay, so let's talk now about the, the pitch profiles or the uh, pitch prints of all of the pitchers on the Chicago Cubs. Okay, in this case now I've colored it by the, the pitch count. You can kind of see all these different trend lines, okay, these best fit lines, linear regression applied to all of these different uh, graphs to kind of say, well, on average, how do they compare against each other? And ideally we want to have as vertical a slope as possible. We kind of see those numbers, of course, the regression lines, and we're drawing out that coefficient in front of the balls, uh, the, the balls of variable to identify, well, who is kind of the best pitcher, how do they compete with each other, and what's kind of interesting in terms of their reliability and how consistent they are. And it's interesting that, uh, that Lester right there uh, does a pretty good job in terms of being very consistent with his uh, strike to balls ratio across the entire game. We take a look at all those different slope lines. Okay, we draw out the parameters, or rather the coefficients of that parameter, and then we put it on a histogram to kind of get a sense for, well, what's kind of the average um, effect of uh, these different uh, pictures in the aggregate. And so we can see this histogram here on the left-hand side where it's kind of bimodal, and that's actually the difference between the, the non-starters and starters. Starters typically are gonna have a much better one. And so we now graph it on the right-hand side with respect to the pitch counts across the entire season, and you can see some really interesting things. That gap or that bend in the curve that we talked about before between the blue and the red lines has returned. Okay, there's this little space around you know, pitch count 100, or sorry, 1,000 to 1,200, where there's kind of a lack of, of pitchers in that area. Okay, well, why is that? We're starting to explore that reason. There's also other data that says that, well, there are actually some starters that are pitching at strikes to balls ratio above uh, some of the starters. Maybe we can use those for uh, a three-inning pitcher or the open pitcher, or maybe use them in more clever ways to rest our, our starters if needs be. Okay, and so one of the things that we wanna kind of um, have you start a dialogue maybe tonight over dinner or what have you, is talk to people like, hey, are we really using these pitchers uh, correctly? Is there more than one way to kind of use the, the bullpen? Let's see. Now in this graph, we're returning to Arietta's sort of pitch print, okay? And then we're gonna turn it on its side, okay? To kind of take a look at over the pitch count, what is the STB ratio? Okay, so the graph on the far left, of course, and there's one game that I've covered in, in black. You can see that it's about uh, game 22. There's a black little bar, if you can see, 
In that particular game, he only pitched about uh, 70 or 80 pitches. Okay, and you can notice then that there's some sort of fluctuation, very similar to maybe some sort of stock price chart, if you will. And what we're trying to find out is if there's a trend going down, well, maybe that's indicative, that's a trigger point that we should maybe pull Jake Arrieta. Okay, and so what we do in the middle graph then is we stack up all the different uh, games to identify, well, how many games did he reach 100 pitches or 90 pitches or 110 pitches to kind of uh, gain some validity in terms of what's significant, okay? And then on the far right, I've colored it all in blue so you can see uh, where all the pitches occurred and how many they occurred and in what order. I've got also a little red vertical line there indicating kind of the magical 100 pitches that we kind of use as a rule of thumb. And then I've got kind of the average uh, strikes to balls ratio uh, for Jake Arrieta across the entire, the entire season. I've got to close up here pretty soon, but I've got two more slides and then I'll take some questions. What's interesting then about uh, Arietta is that he kind of peaks out really well, and so you want to have him there earlier in the game, but then he kind of settles in, and then you're looking for some sort of dips. Where is he starting to get tired? Where is he starting to kind of struggle with some things? Uh, just two more slides then. I take five starters on the top, five, star five non-starters on the bottom, and again, we're taking a look at those trigger points. We're trying to identify if there's some little dips, and you can see some in Hamill at 100 uh, pitches. You can see Hendricks at kind of uh, 95 or 90 pitches. Okay, Lester kind of settles in as well, but then he kind of drops off as well. Interestingly enough, you can also kind of get the same sort of pitch uh, ratios and profiles for the non-stars and kind of say, hey, you know what, how long should we keep these people in? When do they start dropping? There's some indications that they can actually recover, okay, and so those would be maybe non-stars that you want to think about implementing not just maybe as a reliever, as a closer, as a saver, but maybe as some sort of other role. And uh, if we have some more time, we can talk about that later on. Okay, so other strategies then. I talked about the first batter starters. Okay, I mentioned really quickly, and we can talk about this more later on today if you stop by our poster, pitch until the trigger point, okay, using the, the strikes to balls ratio. Um, having closers as starters, so again, there's some uh, data that suggests that we could have some of these closers maybe start in the first couple, couple of innings. Uh, three inning pitchers, okay, we talked about that, and some people kind of thought about that a little bit more. Uh, pitch once through the lineup, we know that quite often people do a little bit better the second or third time that they face a pitcher, and so you can kind of have that as a strategy where you never let any of your batters face the same pitcher twice because he might go back and take a look at the video and do a little bit of adjustments to kind of deal with that. Okay, but ultimately there's a whole bunch of sort of um, opportunities and strategies that I think fill those gaps, fill that, that, that knee or that bend in the curve, fill that lack of space in the, in the red-blue chart that I've got before, and there's a whole bunch of things I think that uh, are opening up, especially now that we have data analytics. I know that managers are looking at this. I know that there's clearly some evidence that it's, it's been working, especially like with the playoff season, the 2016 World Series. Um, but at the end of the day, um, this is perhaps a, a way to go forward with the kind of the next level of analyzing how bullpen strategies can be implemented into Major League Baseball. Thank you for your time and I'll take any questions. Yeah, well, go ahead. Uh, how's it going? That was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, have you thought about the trade-off that there is between pitch management with, say, a guy that may not be pitching very well, but the manager's thinking, okay, I don't want to burn five innings in my bullpen because I have a four-game series coming up this weekend? Yeah, so I think that there's actually some room to kind of re-optimize, you know, that whole sort of a pitching schedule. Right, as soon as people are starting to pitch, you know, maybe two innings or maybe just one set of the lineup, you can start to say, well, maybe every fifth game doesn't make sense. Could you pitch every third game if it works out that there's like a day of rest in between kind of the series, right? So I think there's actually some additional room for optimizing the schedule, bringing up players and from, from the, the minor leagues and vice versa. Yeah, but great question. Yeah, so very great question too. Right, so we kind of took a look at how you can kind of minimize that home field advantage, right, with the first sort of batter strategy, right? And you do kind of lose one of your guys in your bullpen, but fortunately it's one of the chances that the leadoff batter, which is usually one of your best batters, you can kind of eliminate him, so to speak, right? On average, you'll do pretty, pretty well, especially if you know some of his weaknesses. If he can't really hit any curveballs, well, then you train a pitcher and you say, hey, you know what, your one job is to kind of eliminate this first guy with a curveball. Great question. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so my question uh, relates to the pace of play concerns that are like being talked about uh, by MLB. Sorry, uh, what kind of concerns? A pace of play. Oh, pace of play, yep. So uh, I agree with um, 
what you're saying about having like a one hitter pitcher at the beginning, but do you think based on pace of play rules that are being put into like being put in place that that would be a possibility? Because I know they've even talked about limiting pitching changes or mound visits. So do you, have you considered that at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like there's definitely like lots of rules that you could you know fight back in terms of the strategy. But if there's loopholes, if there's opportunities to kind of leverage and, and expand, I believe that teams should kind of do that. So, I mean, you've, you've heard probably earlier today or the last couple of weeks about the intentional uh, ball sort of rule that's being um, thrown out as kind of a potential idea. Uh, that may be one way. I don't think it's significant in terms of the number of you know, minutes that it's going to save because it happens only every like 50th inning or something like that. Um, so, yeah, there's clearly like, you know, some rules that could uh, combat against that. But I think there's also some opportunity to say, hey, if someone is coming out of the bullpen, maybe we can kind of minimize the number of practice pitches that they have because they've been pretty warm. And that might be kind of one way to kind of compensate for the fact that we have more pitchers coming in and out. Um, ideally, some people think that maybe you should even kind of have pitchers return halfway through and, and maybe do some sort of a hybrid model where there's certain sort of uh, pitchers that as long as it's not delaying the game too long, you kind of have these one-on-one uh, -on -one sort of matchups a little bit more often, similar to kind of how basketball has one-on-one -on -one matchups with a really good defender against a really good offense player. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, currently it does. So every single pitch, right, we're going to account for it either as a strike or a ball, uh, which is one thing that um, the, the paper, so I commend you to go off and read the paper, that there's a whole bunch of different pitches that need to be classified as strikes, namely hits, uh, you know, foul balls, that type of thing. But the, intention, the intentional walks and those type of balls are also going to be uh, captured as balls. Yeah, good point. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. So, uh, over here. Uh, one thing that was interesting to me was the, the strikes or the balls versus strikes plots. I would have expected to see more of a, a curvature in that um, as, as the counts got higher to see um, I guess not as quite as much of a uh, straight line relationship. Did you look at modeling that as all with like any curvature or was the straight line um, regression sufficient? So great question. I would love it if managers allowed their pitchers to go a little bit more past that 100 pitch count so we could actually find it out. But it's kind of the, the chicken or the egg sort of question, right? We don't know actually what happens after 100 pitchers because 100 pitches because of that simple fact that people aren't allowing us to go into that range where we'd expect a curvature in terms of reduction of of uh, strikes to balls ratio. Yeah, very insightful. Okay, thank you so much for your time. And again, if you want to keep on talking, I think there's going to be a poster session uh, this afternoon. So please come and ask your questions. We can talk about it some more. Thank you very much, everyone.